it's time to make apple cider. So uh, I am running apples through my grinder, uh, which is a oak drum with little teeth on it that run apples through a smaller and smaller uh, gap. And I have to push them through because this isn't perfectly designed. This is something I'm going to be rebuilding next year. But for this year, it's functioning, so I'm not going to stop it. Um, this is run, it could be run by bicycle, but it's actually being run by an electric motor right now just for ease and quickness of getting it done. Um, and so I'm putting through uh, about a bushel of apples at a time, a little under a bushel of apples, um, to fill up a five gallon bucket of pumice. Pumice is ground apples. Um, and then I'm gonna take that inside. of pumice or shredded apple into this empty bottomed uh, it's kind of like a bucket but it's got open sides so at the bottom I've got this piece of wood with cut out so the any trapped sap on the on the top side of this can drain out so that's kind of like a drainage board and different pieces of fabric that kind of hold all the pumice in from from squishing out of the slats um, each separated by a couple of different uh, pieces of wood to help distribute the pressure a little better. Uh, if you didn't have those, just the top would get pressed and the bottom would still stay pretty soggy. This allows the pressure to be distributed better. Um, and then that will all run out uh, into a collection bucket. Um, and then I will pasteurize it and make apple juice. And I will also um, kick in some yeast to a large carboy uh, to make some hard cider for later. So, so here we go. Mm -hmm. already get a lot of juice out just for my body weight. So I have to get this top cap which distributes all the pressure low enough to go under this little bell shaped foot on my press. And I just built this um, thanks to a friend of mine in Madison who had built this in the 19, was it 30 years ago in a, in a shop class um, and just never used it so I mounted it uh, to this and uh, and put a handle on it and now through the wonder of screws <laughs> and physics etc etc I can exert quite a lot of pressure down on here and I have about a gallon out now I expect another gallon and a half if not two gallons out of this five gallons of pumice so about half of this volume is liquid about a huge rush. And 
then I get my two and a half gallons. So I got a gallon here, a gallon here, and a half gallon here. And I put them in pots with water. And then this water will be brought up to um, 75 degrees Celsius, about 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the internal temperature of this liquid reaches um, 170 or 75, um, I start a timer for 20 minutes. It uh, pasteurizes for that time. At the end of the 20 minutes, I clean the lid, put it back on, and they're sealed. And then they sit um, and cool down, and uh, they should be, should be shelf, -sta shelf stable for a half year to a year. Today we're continuing the cider making, and here I've got my press. I've got a press full of apples, three different cheeses. They're called cheeses when you make a bundle of apples and press them. And then in here I've already pressed uh, one bucket full. Um, I've got about three gallons out of that. And so this is a six gallon carboy. So I'm about to pitch my yeast. And this is just an active dry wine yeast. And luckily I had some still on hand, but next year I don't know what, quite what I'm going to do because um, I'm not going to be able to order more yeast, right? So I might have to wash and save some of this yeast. Might also try and save some of it as brewer's yeast. We'll see how that goes. But so, you know, there's different ways to pitch this. I'm just pitching it directly and right before I do a press. And then all that yeast will get incorporated as, the, as everything drips through. I'm also going to add, I mean, while I've got it, um, yeast nutrient. Because cider doesn't have quite everything that yeast needs to be happy, so I add a, tis, a teaspoon of yeast nutrient per gallon. One, two, three. I have a little helper here. Four, five. And this is food grade urea. And if you know anything about uh, urine, uh, urea comes from urine. So I could, in theory, make my own. Uh, next year, we'll, mm, <laughs> we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, so now, I'm going to uh, run the press and uh, get some more juice in here, yeah. And he is worse than a wasp uh, because he's got hands and he can move these things around. So I have to keep him at bay while I press this. Uh-uh. He is very interested in all the apple juice. Yesterday we pressed gallons and gallons of cider or of uh, unfiltered apple juice that I pasteurized and saved in bottles. And now I'm working on the hard cider. And he's still very interested. What kid doesn't love gallons and gallons of apple juice? Chickens. Give our chickens diabetes with all this sh sugar. Diabetic chickens. So one problem I was talking about is that I don't have uh, access to more yeast. And so if I needed to, I could harvest yeast. And this is washed yeast. And so essentially um, what I'm able to do is at the bottom of my fermentation tank, um, a lot of the pectin and the yeast will settle out to the bottom and create what are called leaves. It's sediment, it just sits there and um, in the bottom uh, above it there will be an active zone of yeast and so what happens is uh, when I have one of these carboys full and I'm ready to decant it and um, let it settle out I can pull off all the top stuff and leave that bottom inch and then when I draw that bottom inch out uh, leaving as much sediment behind as I can. Then I can um, pour some distilled water in there, shake it around. Um, in this case, I'm using reverse osmosis water because I don't have distilled water. And then this uh, could be poured, you know, a third of this could have been poured into each of the carboys, and that would have brought active yeast uh, into the um, into the the new cider to promote fermentation. Um, but because I still have some uh, good purchase yeast, I'm using that. But once I run out, I'll be switching to washed yeast. Yes. Yes, you are very chatty. All right, now I'm down in the basement and it's January and I've got a whole bunch of different um, casks here with my different ciders. So 
Here's a cider from that you just saw being pressed, and here's another cider over here is uh, grape wine that I made in a previous video. Um, and here are some other ciders. So these are all ciders that are just kind of sitting here waiting to be um, moved into secondary fermentation. So basically they fermented in these containers and now I'm gonna take them out and put just the cider and leave all these lees or the or the remaining, the remaining yeast and leave that out. Um, and then uh, up here, you can see a variety of bottles. We have mead and cider and other things uh, from previous years. So um, after they've sat for a while, then we'll be putting them into these, um, these empty bottles and then they'll just age. Generally my mead uh, has to age for at least nine months. My cider depends on the cider. Some cider is drinkable in six months and some needs a year and a half. So it really depends. Um, but yeah, uh, looking pretty good going into the winter with lots of cider for drinking, which is kind of nice. I thought it was time to do a little bit of an update because it is midwinter now um, and you know this was completely full of, of jars um, going into the summer or going into the winter we're still doing pretty well we have plenty of pickles um, we have quite a bit of honey we're starting to get down on our maple syrup um, our jams are doing okay and we're about halfway through our tomatoes and it's January so um, we're going to do okay going into the spring um, eventually once we start running out of tomatoes uh, our soups will be less exciting. Uh, but we do have lots of potatoes, so let's go look at those. So over here in the hurricane door that comes down to our basement, we have lots of potatoes in boxes, we are in um, milk crates. So we have one, two, three, four milk crates left of uh, potatoes, not to mention all of our carrots um, that you saw me putting in sand, um, kohlrabi, turnips. Um, we're doing real well on the, the root vegetable crops. And that's not to mention that we have lots of uh, squash uh, still remaining. We probably have a dozen or so of these uh, Long Island cheese squash. These are my favorite. They, they store really long. This will be good well into March, April. And then here in these crates we've got apples. And you know, I, I picked this apple in September. And yeah, it's got some spots on it, but it's totally edible. Uh, great for pies, all those sorts of things. Um, and then down here we have sweet potatoes. Um, and more apples. So we're doing pretty well. Um, not to mention I have a dozen quarts of apple sauce still. I barely even touched that. So that's, um, and then grain wise I see one, we probably have about four bushels of grain left. Um, I originally made nine bushels of grain. So we're, you know, we're a little about halfway through our grain supply. Um, and that will be replenished in July. So we're doing okay. And finally over here we have our store-bought stuff. This is the things that we can't replenish. We've still got, let's see, each of those is three pounds of salt. We've still got 18 pounds of salt. We've got a couple quarts of olive oil. We've got a couple gallons of cooking oil. Um, olives, peas, oh, quite a lot of legumes. So like um, lentils and peas and beans. Um, and other kind of snacky things. Um, we do a little bit of store-bought pasta, bouillon, peppercorns, you know, we, we got little odds and ends. Uh, we're doing pretty well coming into February and the spring is generally the hungry time and so that's when we would start to imagine that we were going to be um, having trouble. Uh, but really we're we're sailing through. Um, we will have problems though in terms of cooking oil. That's going to be our Achilles heel. We don't have a way to make cooking oil. We don't have animals to make um, dairy, to make um, butter or other types of um, oil or fat. Um, so really, oil is going to be our Achilles heel. Uh, another thing that we're another thing that we're missing is um, onions. We ran out of onions. My onions just didn't grow enough. Um, I didn't grow enough of them. Uh, so we've been having to uh, put cut up kohlrabi and cook that with onion powder. Uh, before we do a soup instead of onions, and that works okay. Gives us some onion flavor, but it's not the same. So I'm looking forward to having onions, and it's one of the first things I've started in the garden already. Here at the end of January, I already have um, onions growing. Mm -hmm.